preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Of the Institute of Psychotherapy at Tel Aviv University for our second annual lecture. I want to introduce Dr. Mesnikov, chairman of the American Committee for the Institute, who will tell you something about the Institute's work. Thank you, Dr. Stockhammer. Isaac Besheva Singer and friends of Tel Aviv University, I am pleased to extend to you all a warm welcome to the second annual lecture for the benefit of the Institute of Psychotherapy of Tel Aviv University. I'd like to tell you a few things about the Institute. It is not often that the introduction of an educational and training program can importantly affect an entire nation. The Institute of Psychotherapy, which was established in 1971, has had a dramatic impact on mental health services throughout Israel. The Institute is a pioneering program which has filled the great gap which existed in interdisciplinary training in psychotherapy. The absence of postgraduate training and the lack of a dynamic orientation in the treatment of mental disability had been noted for many years, particularly by the World Health Organization consultant, Dr. Jalita, who is a member of our American Committee in her study of the Israeli Mental Health Services in 1965. The absence of trained manpower in dynamic psychotherapy had led, by default, to emphasis on institutional care. A fourfold increase had occurred in admissions to Israeli mental hospitals from 1954 to 1973, ranging to over 12,000 in that year. The need for a comprehensive and appropriate range of institutional and community services was evident. While the shift toward comprehensive services with a strong community base has been a worldwide phenomenon, Israel presented a special situation. Apart from the stress on the individual in any modern society undergoing rapid change, special tensions arise in the number of new immigrants from many diverse cultures who are welcome to Israel to fulfill their quest for a new life in their homeland. Many newcomers arrive with serious problems due to the persecution they have suffered. This is compounded further by the need to adjust to a new environment, a strange language, and a different way of life under the constant threat of war as well as with the special uncertainties of daily life which plague the Israeli citizen. An important spur to the development of the Institute came from a small group of American professionals who, at a critical period of planning for the Institute, raised funds and provided encouragement that both materially and symbolically supported the efforts of Israeli leaders who were trying to launch this new program. A group of distinguished scholars, psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers at Tel Aviv University moved to develop this interdisciplinary training program in psychotherapy, an event of great significance in a field traditionally led by physicians and an academic community that is quite conservative. They had the vision to recognize that the shift from an institutional to a community focus would have to include all of the mental health disciplines and was essential to changing the Israeli system of care. As it begins its fifth year, the Institute has made remarkable progress in achieving its goals. The success of the program, including the graduating of its second class in June of 1975, has resulted from the Institute clearly identifying and fulfilling a major gap in mental health training. The Institute is the acknowledged leader in interdisciplinary training in the psychotherapies in all of Israel. It has affected therapeutic programs in the institutions from which its students and teachers come. It has stimulated the development of similar programs in other sections of the country, notably Haifa and Beersheba. 
It has established cooperative programs with a psychotherapy training section of the Israeli Institute of Psychoanalysis in Jerusalem. There are 65 students ranging in age from 27 to 35, physicians, psychologists, and social workers. Of these, three quarters are women, and most of the students were either born in or came to Israel when they were very young. More than half of the students come from the government hospitals, which are equivalent to our state hospitals, and which have been seriously lacking in professionals trained in psychotherapy. All of the candidates work full-time in institutions, and their training takes place after regular working hours. The teachers come from the university, from Kupat Cholim, which is the labor health insurance program, and from the government hospitals, so that interactions begun between the teachers and students in the classroom continues in the hospitals. The joining of Tel Aviv University and its Department of Psychiatry with Kupat Cholim brings leadership and strength to bear on the great needs of the government hospitals. The Institute of Psychotherapy thus affects all elements of the mental health system. The Institute has now relocated from inadequate space at Tel Aviv University campus to very spacious facilities in the Yaffa Mental Health Center. The center is located in what was the French hospital, a comfortable old two-story building with a lovely courtyard garden. The location of the two programs in the same building permit integration of the first and model Israeli mental health center with the training program of the Institute. The casualties of the Yom Kippur War had a great and adverse impact on the emotional well-being of the people, particularly of those directly affected by loss of family members. The constant threat to survival of individuals as well as of a nation has drained their energies and spirit. Hopefully, the new agreement in the Sinai will provide the relief that is essential for Israelis to concentrate their attention on building, a homeland, <clears throat> on building a homeland and a nation. We appreciate your support in joining with us tonight to hear Isaac Besheva Singer. We invite and welcome your interest in supporting the Institute. It is now my pleasure to turn the program back to Dr. Stockheimer, who will introduce our speaker. Mr. Singer is the author of seven novels, hundreds of short stories, sketches, essays, and plays. Yentl, adopted from the short story Yentl, the Yeshiva Boy, is currently playing on Broadway. Although he originally wrote in Hebrew, Mr. Singer has long adopted Yiddish as his medium of expression. His writings reflect the teachings of the rabbis and a deep and involved interest in Jewish mysticism, psychic phenomena, and the persistence of Jewish consciousness. The recipient of a number of awards, including the National Book Award for Children's Books and Short Stories, he is a member of the National Institute of Arts and Letters, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Following his lecture, Mr. Singer will answer questions from the floor. Mr. Singer. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Dr. Stuckhammer, Dr. Mesnikov, ladies and gentlemen. People often ask me, are you religious? And it isn't easy for me to answer because a concept of religion has many ramifications. The basic element of religion is divine revelation. It isn't important whether God reveals himself in a burning bush or through the intervention of an angel. But can there be also a religion which does not rely upon revelation? The fact is that a number of philosophers preach this very kind of religion. But the God of the philosophers never could acquire prophets, temples, or priests. To the best of my knowledge, there is no temple where people pray to Spinoza's substance, Leibniz's monad 
of the monads, or Hegel's zeitgeist. When man serves God, it is a God who speaks to man, issues commands, hears his prayers, and rewards him in this life or after that. It is no coincidence that all the religions have portrayed God as a king. Just like a king, man's God must reward richly and punish severely. Like a king, he must possess treasures and have his favorites and his traitors. No matter how awesome nature may appear to us, we will neither pray to her nor sacrifice ourselves in her behalf. If religion must be closely bound with revelation, then I cannot properly call myself a religious person. It is true that I believe in God and even in his ability to reveal himself. But I cannot base my belief on actual revelation. Personally, I have never experienced one. Those that are described in holy books have not convinced me of their authenticity. Authenticity, let me read it well. But at the same time, I believe without revelation that there is a God who rules the world and keeps watch over it. I often pray to this God who perhaps has never revealed himself to anyone. I have no clear conception of what he is, what his demands are, nor what his aims and motives are. I have made peace, <coughs> peace with the concept that it is possible, at least for me, to serve a God who is always silent. At the same time, my God is neither Spinoza's nor an indifferent nature, but a God with all the divine attributes. Although I studied Spinoza's ethics for years, I never was convinced that God lacks will, purpose, or compassion and that for him there is no good or evil. It is true that I lack positive proof that he does have will, purpose, and a sense of justice. It, has, it was proven a long time ago that man's mind is too limited to solve this problem, just as it cannot square a circle or build a perpetual motion machine. But I have built for myself a private God. You might even label him an idol. I have endowed my God with all the properties and attributes that appeal to me. I have fashioned him precisely to suit my taste. I've formed him out of my intellect, my emotions, my limited experience and imagination. I cannot boast with certainty of the existence of my God and his attributes, but I can firmly state that my faith has grown over the years. I still have many questions concerning my God, and I have formulated a whole system of defense for him and his actions. Do not suggest to me that he is a product of my imagination, since I freely concede this. Nor accuse me of stealing my concept from others. I confess that I borrowed whatever I liked. Mine is an eclectic God. Along with the Jews, the Christians, and all the religious philosophers, I believe that God has existed forever. I can no more picture the birth or demise of God then I can conceive of the beginning and end of time or the limit of space. I can easily make peace with Spinoza's contention that God is identical with nature. But I do not agree with him that God is a rigid mechanism, a perpetually wound clock, 
a slave of his own laws. My God must be dynamic, creative, possessed of boundless imagination and infinite wisdom. I despise cruelty in men, and I would not permit a thought that my God can be cruel. He must combine wisdom with goodness. I love beauty in a work of art, and I could not accept a God who did not possess beauty. I do not care for people or works of art that lack love. My God must be a lover, eternally in love. But with whom can he be in love? My personal answer is with his creations. Here I am prepared to draw on the Kabbalah. The Kabbalists saw in God the principle of male and female. According to the Kabbalists, the higher spheres are bound in unions. Angels, seraphim, cherubim, and holy souls are engaged in divine loves, in divine copulations. God himself bears a godly love toward the divine presence, the Shechene. But like all lovers, he has his obstacles. In the text of the hymn of Akdomus, the hymn uh, of Hashavuas, it states that God creates a batch of new angels daily. It isn't beyond possibility that he creates them to satisfy his craving for love. Love and creation are to God one and the same thing. Every artist is an experimenter, and my God experiments eternally. His every star, every planet, is an artistic experiment, a part of the divine laboratory. True art is not chaotic, and God's works are the opposite of chaos. In other words, he's not a modern poet. No work of art can consist entirely of light and positivism. In every genuine work of art, there should be light and shade, harmony and disharmony. The true artist does not give away all the secrets at the very beginning. Often the artist himself doesn't precisely know in which direction his pen or brush is heading. He often surprises himself. My private God boasts all the artistic qualities. He creates and he fails. He makes artistic errors, then rectifies them. He creates the most varied and unexpected situations. Since he is unlimited as to quantity and quality, he has used only a minuscule part of his fantasy and originality. He is not the fixed mechanism of the materialists, but a God who solves and forever changes his form and direction. New ideas constantly ferment within him. He is full of divine emotions. He wages a struggle against innumerable inhibitions as every artist does. Did he himself create these inhibitions? Are they a part of his nature? I do not believe in an absolute perfection. God keeps on improving himself. He is mighty, but not so almighty that he need no longer struggle. Godliness is struggle. His entire existence is one crisis. He and his creations stand in constant danger. God is eternally fearful of destroying himself, of exhausting his divine powers, of falling into the web of routine. He must maintain an eternal watch over himself. He is full of restfulness, 
but also of much unrest. He is pleased by his achievements, but grieved by his mistakes. Some of his works must be done over and frequently corrected. Some of his experiments lead into a blind alley. It is true that he has sufficient time and space to correct matters. But his creative urge often surpasses even time and space. He has burned himself with so many plans and tasks that one eternity is insufficient for him. He must create new eternities. He is not, not only the painter, he must also provide the canvas. He is not merely the playwright, he must also put up the theater and construct the stage. My God is not only an artist, he is a scientist as well. I may even call him a psychiatrist, there is no reason why not. In God, art and science are one and the same. Artists and scientists must have their disciples. God is not a writer who writes for the drawer, nor an inventor who creates toys for himself. God must have his public, his audience. He welcomes judgment. He is not afraid of adverse criticism, but he cannot make his efforts too plain, too obvious. His creations must have tension, suspense. What's more, even an artist such as he need not please everyone equally. There are those readers who protest he is no writer at all. His works lack rhyme or reason. He doesn't even exist. A cosmic inkwell exploded and a universal daubing resulted. But what is God to do? Discuss his work with everybody? Reveal chapters that are scheduled to come later? Present the third act before the second? God is not a commentator. He does not give interviews. How right he is, by the way. <laughs> nor is he above lacking, nor is he above locking himself up in an ivory tower. But his silence is just as imperative as his speech. God does, not, does reveal himself, but gradually, line by line. He demands the reader's trust, but if the reader refuses to trust him, he cannot help him. Like every artist, God is sensitive. Perhaps he wasn't too happy when Spinoza described him as some sort of lifeless machine. He probably was hurt by the twaddle of Feuerbach. However, he may also be vexed by those who profess to speak in his name and who pretend to be privy to all, to all his secrets. The praise is often as petty and as blasphemy A creator must possess much patience. The greatest misunderstanding rampant among God's readers is their concept of death. Nearly all of them are convinced that when a chapter ends, so does the novel. But to allow the readers to remember all the chapters is impossible. God's novel is too long to be recorded in a single brain. The readers must change along with the situation. Since in God's novel, they are also his hearers. As in his theater, the spectators are also the actors. No actor can remain constantly on stage. He must play his part, then retire into the wings. He must change his costume and his makeup for new roles. The old parts aren't lost. Every word, every sound is recorded. In God's theater, in God's library, in God's museum, nothing is ever lost. 
If he chooses, he can play everything over again. The resurrection of the dead is for God an easy task. Plays that have ended in one theater are often restaged in other theaters. Everything that has lived, lives on forever. All problems concerning God can be reduced to a single one. Why the suffering? The answer is, without suffering, there is no art. Suffering and joy represent the elements upon which is based the divine drama. God, the creator, is himself the universal sufferer. Our suffering is his suffering, while he creates. We are he. Whoever arrives at this truth can accept suffering with some patience. Only with some, not really. A good reader does not become angry with his favorite author when some situation displeases him. The question is, what are my or your responsibilities to such a God? How do you serve a God who ignores you completely, or so it seems? My answer is as personal as my concept of God is private. We cannot with certainty serve a God who does not tell us what to do. Human dignity actually demands that a silent God be as ignored as he ignores us, as it, as it looks. It is nevertheless a fact that no matter how small our role in, in the world drama, we do participate in it. We have a role to play in each generation. We get the power to play it. What is more, we live with the feeling that we are granted a measure of free choice. Our role is not one that has already been played. We must first play it, and we feel we can play it well or badly. We call this feeling free will or free choice. We can play our role truthfully or falsely. I do not agree with Spinoza that everything is completely determined, that we perform in a pattern strictly prescribed since eternity. I choose to believe exactly the opposite. God is free, and he delegates freedom to his creatures. Freedom is to me a divine attribute. Human freedom is a part of divine freedom. Yes, in a sense, we ourselves write or edit our own role. I'm not all sure that God has revealed himself in fire and told us how to behave. But for me, the Ten Commandments are the nearest thing to truth, justice, and even beauty. Their principle is that one's happiness should not be based on the misery of others. These rules are the best framework within which men can function. I cannot imagine a religion founded on the opposite principle. I personally apply this principle not only to men, but to all of God's creatures. I do not want to satisfy my appetite on the misery of a steer, a fish, or a chicken. As long as these creatures are not granted their rights, all fates remain to me unjust. The Ten Commandments state a principle, but not the method of applying or realizing it. The fact is that often this principle appears impossible to achieve. For thousands of years, men has preached peace, but wars go on. The streets are overrun with murderers, swindlers, and thieves. But I still say to myself, these commandments remain our only way. I neither can seek another way, nor do I want to. If I'm wrong and God prefers murder, theft, or falsehood, I would rather serve an idol of justice than a God of injustice. 
For me, it is no longer a question of whether or not the Ten Commandments are right, but rather how they can best be applied in every relationship between men and men, men and women, men and beast. I accept the Ten Commandments precisely as I do the principle of identity or nature. It can be said that breathing is an obsession, but at the same time, one must keep on breathing. Since the Ten Commandments are based on free choice between good and evil, I must accept free choice as a reality, not as the illusion Spinoza believed it to be. In his ethics, Spinoza addressed himself to the reader and tells him what he should and should not do. If everything is preordained, then the universe is a finished motion picture, and it makes no sense to employ such words as do and do not as Spinoza does in his writings. I must and I want to believe in free will. I do not feel obligated to accept such religious dogmas as the sacrifice of animals, wearing ritual fringes, or putting on the phylacteries. Some of these dogmas have been and could continue to remain symbols which remind men of his responsibilities. But to me, they are interchangeable with other symbols. On the other hand, the service of God must be bound up with a discipline. One cannot simply read the Ten Commandments and agree with them. Our entire life is filled with temptations to break the Ten Commandments. It requires a will of iron, a strong character, and firm discipline to go through life according to their teachings. The temptation to break them is always, exists always. They don't always fit our nature, our dreams. Neither are they clearly defined. What one part of humanity considers adultery, another part considers right behavior. The Jews have never considered monogamy God's law, while the Christians think that monogamy is God's law. So the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is not really clearly defined. The Torah is to me a guidebook by which we learn how to play our role to the best of our ability and our conviction. Since the drama keeps constantly changing with new roles and new characters ever unfolding, the Torah cannot remain static. I believe in a dialectical approach to these laws. It is the tragedy of all religions that dogmas have supplanted principles, that the means have become an end. For this reason, Christians who fear to, to tread on a straw cross could set up an inquisition. Mohammedans who observed the fast of the Ramadan and performed all the Muslim good deeds could burn cities with all their inhabitants. And Jews who feared a crumb of leavened bread during Passover could give short weight and false measure. The dogma is only as valuable as its contribution to the spiritual elevation of men, to a sense of justice and compassion for all that lives, and to a dedication to the great enigma we call God. My God is one who goes forward. I almost said he's a God seeker. Yes, God searches within his boundless pot potentials. He's totally free. However, because of this very fact, his every step is fraught with danger. He can, like men, do much good, but he may also do something in his godly experiments that he will regret. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that God 
regretted having created man. What is more, his creation, just like an artist's, is not without consequences. After the first chapter of a novel has been written, the author is no lo longer completely free. He has created characters that cannot be overlooked in subsequent chapters. Even though God and man find himself in constant crisis, I am confident that in the never-ending aggregate, everything will turn out infinitely better than the human imagination could conceive. Paradise and the resurrection of the dead are symbols of the great goodness and beauty, which the master artist is capable of creating. He can repay many times over for our suffering and his. He has reserves, <coughs> he has reserves of great joy. Happiness is not exclusively a human pursuit. God, too, strives for happiness. Since God lives and everything that exists emanates from him, there's no such thing as death. Death is a temporary institution, a transition and transformation. That which we call death is the constant change of form, the eternal ascent from great to great. My fate is not such that I would try to impose it upon others. It is a, a personal fate born of my fantasy and my dreams. Its basis is tolerance. How can, how can one be intolerant when, when one has no sure revelations to back up one's beliefs? Since my religion consists of seeking God rather than serving one already found, I am an adherent of what is called psychical research. Each fact, no matter how strange, should be investigated. God has countless surprises for us. Science in general and psychical research in particular will encounter experiments which today's men would have considered impossible. Creation has neither end nor limit in time and space. No quality and quantity. Every part of creation is endless. Since we ourselves are parts of this eternity, we can always discover something new and unique. Man is by his very nature a discoverer, an inventor, and a creator. He is the very image of God. <laughs> Creativity is for me a very encompassing idea. I would say that everything which gives a man pleasure, or let's call it spiritual pleasure, is creative. And what causes him pain is an inhibition in his creative desire. Like Spinoza, I am a hedonist. Like the Kabbalists, I believe that the principle of male and female exist not only in the lower spheres, but in the higher ones as well. The universal novel of creation, like the novel of an earthly writer, is finally a love story. The Kabbalists compared the evil host to the female, and this strange comparison has deep significance. A male can bring out his semen quickly and in abundance, but the female demands time, patience, and a period of ripening. She is, if you want, the inhibition, but she is also the power which transmutes intention into deed. The Kabbalists saw in God a division into the masculine and the feminine, which they called the Shechene. God himself must have time and space for his work. In his original form, he is not perfect, but ripens in infinite time. God, like the universe, is expanding. Men can serve him by creating within their narrow worlds, in their small way, conditions which will permit creativity for all, from the bee to man, 
from the microbe that sours our milk to the artist. The freedom to which we aspire should not be an end in itself. Its ultimate aim must be man's boundless creativity. God creates continuously, and continuous creation is man's destiny too. God, like the artist, is free. Like the artist, his work cannot be predetermined. His laws are aesthetic and ethical, and therefore bound to change. Continual change is their very essence. Beauty is their purpose. God's fantasy is their limit. God, like the artist, never knows clearly what he will do and how his work will develop. Only the intention is clear, to, to bring out masterpieces and to imp improve them all the time. I once called God a struggling artist. This continual aspiration is what men call suffering. In this system, emotions are not passive, as in Spinoza's philosophy. God himself is emotion. God thinks and feels. Compassion and beauty are two of his endless attributes. In my novel, The Slave, I have expressed this notion in these words. The summer night throbbed with joy. From all sides came music. Warm winds bore the smells of grain, fruit, and pine trees to him. Itself a Kabbalistic book, the night was crowded with sacred names and symbols, mystery upon mystery. In the distance, where sky and earth merged, lightning flashed, but no thunder followed. The stars looked like letters of the alphabet, wild points, notes of music. Sparks flickered above the Bay of Pharos. The world was a parchment scrolled with words and song. Every now and then, Jacob heard a murmur in his ear, as if some unseen being was whispering to him. He was surrounded by powers, some good, some evil, some cruel, some merciful, but each with its own nature and its own task to perform. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for bearing with me and listening to this personal story and personal point of view. If it does not serve any other purpose, it will help, I hope, to clarify the way of thinking of a single writer. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. 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 The late I will repeat her. The lady said that I have perfectly distorted what Spinoza said. If I did, this must be a part of the Godhead. Because according to Spinoza, there are no mistakes. Spinoza says that there is there, there is not the false does not exist. Only crippled truths. So I have crippled the truth, and it's still according. He has created his own opposition.
like the English king who used to give us holiday to the, the men who are posted. So does the Almighty. Who is going to be right? We will see at the end. Since we are part of the Godhead and he is also part of the Godhead, he plays his part, we will play our part, and the Almighty plays all parts. According to these, to this, these papers, which have no scientific evidence, <laughs> which are completely arbitrary. Yes, please. Right. <laughs> 
nothing but everything which happened to me can be explained just by pure natural laws, or, what, or you can call it ante laws, call it as, as you will. In other words, I cannot really tell you that I saw a ghost. I wish I would. <laughs> The gentleman. Do you practice meditation, Mr. Singer? <laughs> what is that? The lady asked if I practice meditation. I, I never sit down and say, say I'm going to meditate between one and two. This I don't know. <laughs> but I would say, you cannot really avoid meditation. Whether you call it meditation or thinking or moving or pondering, we all, we all practice meditation. Sometimes I envy the powers which meditate less and do more. And my 
I'd say more or less yes, because I began by being a very hard disciple of Spinoza. And was pantheism was always my my beloved uh, game. But I, I don't uh, agree with Spinoza that God has only two attributes, or, or two attributes are known, which is extension and thinking. I feel that we can give to God as many attributes as we want. It is, Spinoza also says that God has numberless attributes, but he says that we know only two. And I say, whether we know or not, there's no reason why it could not be merciful, uh, beautiful, and some. By the way, the Kabbalists gave to the Almighty ten attributes. So, how, how do we know maybe they were right? Yes, please. How, what happened to the gentleman who wanted to ask that question? Yeah. He did? He went. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Can you tell us what you mean in the seminar church? Please, you tell me what the gentleman asked about. What do I mean when I say I'm Jewish? I mean that my father was a rabbi. And his father was a rabbi. And my mother's father was also a rabbi. And they wanted to, to make me also a rabbi, what I rebelled. <laughs> if this is not, and I started just the same, I started the Talmud and the Zohar and the, the Kabbalah and the Hasidism. If this, if this is not enough, <laughs> I will tell you that I don't consider myself a hundred percent Jew. <laughs> I think the Jewishness has grades. There is a perfect Jew, 100% Jew, 50% Jew, 1% Jew I am, I don't know, but I, would, I, I hope that you will admit that at least 1% of a Jew I am. <laughs> as far as my father was concerned, he told me when I began to, uh, to do things which he did not like, which, which means I put on a tie or I trimmed my face, he called me a goy. But even he admitted that I'm still Jewish. <laughs> How would you defend the negative criticism in the play Yenko that you reveal too much that is sacred for everything that's all done now? The lady wants me to know how I would defend the play Yenko because some people complain that when the lady goes to the mix where she's naked, all I can tell you is that our grandmothers who went to the mikve were all naked. <laughs> and this is not my fault. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, since I see that there are no more questions, which means I have answered tonight all the questions, all the possible There are a couple more. <laughs> How do you define your God in terms of the Holocaust? The gentleman wants to know how I can explain the, the Holocaust. The truth is that if I could explain the Holocaust and all the Holocaust which have taken place since man was created, I would have even a larger audience than I have today. <laughs> but just the same, let me say what the Kabbalists say. They say that God has given to men the greatest gift which he could bestow, and this is free will. God has given us a knife, and he said, with this knife, carve, carve, carve nice uh, figures, cut bread, cut, uh, peel apples, and so on and so on. And we have taken this knife and we slaughtered people. But since but yet, God cannot take back this gift is not an Indian giver. Once he gives a gift, it is we, we must keep it at least for some time. And what we do with this knife may be a great disappointment to him. But I guess he hopes, I guess hope, that we may one day realize that we have used our knife in a bad way and we will improve. This is what the Kabbalists say. All I can say is I'm Upstairs again. <laughs> I am always afraid of the questions which come from upstairs. But <laughs> I feel, let me hear them anyway.
issue, the difference between religion and mysticism. Religion is mysticism which has become a routine which the masses have accepted. It's always, every religion begins with mysticism. A single man has mystic feelings, he has the feeling that God has revealed to him. Then he goes out and preaches, let's say, let's take Moses or Jesus. And after he has preached, and after his feeling, his mystic feeling was, is accepted by the masses, it becomes diluted, distorted, and it becomes religion. It becomes all dogma and very little feeling. How do you like this definition? I'm sure you don't agree with me. But I see that one lady in a red dress does agree. I wonder if I might ask a question. Yes, why not? Paradise have, but a rebellious one, 
every hair of which points at revolution. <laughs> a little delinquent who braided his long hair in a ponytail, tied with a wire, he tore out of a bed of nails, asked, what kind of demands come at Yankee? First, that the week in Gehenna should not last six days, but that we should have a four-day week. <laughs> Secondly, that each villain should get a six-week vacation, during which he should, be, we should, he should be permitted to return to Earth and break the Ten Commandments without being punished. Thirdly, that we should not be kept away from our beloved sisters, the female sins. We will ask for sex and free love in the hand. Fourthly, dreams of a chopped off head, said Chaim Bones, a former gangster. The angel Duma is not afraid of your demands and petitions. He does not even bother to read them. The saints in paradise use them for toilet paper. <laughs> what do you propose? The angels, like the humans, understand one thing, blows. We must arm ourselves, robot the angel Duma, storm the court of heaven, break a few ribs among the righteous. Then we must take over paradise, Leviathan, the wild dogs, the sanctified wine, all the other good things, and then arm ourselves at the tit bourgeois who had fallen into hell for swindling kind of, where will we get arms in hell? They don't give us a single knife or fork. The fire calls we eat, we have to pick up with our naked fingers. Besides, Gehenna does not last longer than a year except for Sabbaths and holidays. I am supposed to end my turn on the day after Purim. If we begin a conspiracy now, the term may be prolonged. Do you know the punishment for conspiring against the angel Duma? This is a misfortune of, this, of us sinners, young to yield. Everyone is only for himself. How about the wicked who will come after us? <laughs> Every day new transports arrive. What will happen to them? This year is not so bad yet. It has 12 months. <laughs> the next year will be a leap year. All 13 months. It is not my duty to worry about all the wicked in the world, the flight of the swindler. I happen to be an innocent victim. All I did was forge a signature. I shed ink, not blood. <laughs> Those who murder set fire to houses and cause children to perish in the flames. Those who stab and rape are not my brothers. If I were in charge here, I would keep them until the end of the year 6000. Didn't I say that every sinner is after himself? Young spoke. If we cannot unite, the angels can do to us as they please. In that case, why the idle talk? Let's play cards and finish out the rest of the Sabbath. Comrade Young to your sinner with eyeglasses spoke up. May I say something? Say, talk does not change anything. My opinion is that we should concentrate mainly on culture. Before we come with maximal demands like six week vacation, with sex and with free love, we must show the angels that we are sinners with spiritual goals. <laughs> I propose that we publish a magazine. <laughs> a magazine in Gehenna? <laughs> yes, a magazine. And its name should be the Gehenna Nick. <laughs> when you sign a petition, the angels take one look at it and they throw it away or they blow their noses into it. But a magazine they would read. 
the righteous in paradise expire from boredom. They are all fed with the secrets of the talk. They want to know what's going to come in hell. They are curious about our views of the world, our way of thinking, our philosophy, our psychology, our sociology. Silly battle. I'm going to sleep high amongst the gangster yacht. What will we write in the magazine? And who will write? And how will this help us? Asks a sinner with a hoarse voice. You don't have to worry about who will do the writing, said the sinner with eyeglasses. We have a lot of writers here. As a matter of fact, your hand is full of them. I was a writer and knew it myself. I was condemned to hell because I was supposed to be a rebel rouse. Every Monday and Thursday, I changed my opinion. When it was profitable to preach atheism, I preached atheism. And likewise, I preached religion when that failed. They heaped accusations against me. But the fact is that I had many readers, and they wrote me enthusiastic fan letters. It is true that I changed my opinions like laws, but were my readers any more consistent? Here in hell, a sinner who looked young, had long hair reaching down to his shoulders, asked, why publish a magazine? Why not open a theater? <laughs> we have here not too much paper. Besides, it's so hot here that the magazine will catch fire. The righteous are all half blind and don't understand our modern language, our idiots, and are not accustomed to our spelling. <clears throat> My advice is that we should organize a theatrical group. A theater of hell? Who is going to play? And who is going to attend? They punish us day and night. We will play on the Sabbath and on holidays. And, uh, and they ask, Ritzingehenne? I have an idea for a play. A love affair between a sinner and a saint. <laughs> what kind of love affair? The wicked and the saints will never meet. I have thought it through thoroughly. My hero is lying on his bed of nails and screaming. He's an opera singer by profession. <laughs> and so wrecked by pain that he breaks out into an aria. <laughs> she, she, the saint, hears his song and falls in love with his voice. And then the saints in paradise are all deaf. This one happens not to be death. <laughs> well then, but follows. To be able to meet him, she asks for permission from the angel Eshiel to dress up like a demon and to become one who dispenses lashes in the hand. Permission is granted, and so the two lovers meet. She is supposed to whip him, but when the angel Duma looks away, she covers him with kisses and they soon reach a point where they cannot be one without the other. Pure rubbish, cried out the sinner with eyeglasses. <laughs> Melodrama of the worst kind. <laughs> what do you want to play in your hand? Miguel Laws, Moshe Fahim, etc. Our sinners love action. A play like this would give the actors an opportunity to sing a song, to dance, <laughs> and to make to make a couple of spicy jokes. Assuming that it will work, what would be the result? Theater is the best form of propaganda. It may very well be that the saints and the angels will visit our theater to see our plays. And between one act and the other, we will explain to them our point of view, our situation, and our philosophy. Your play is not realistic, and your plan is not realistic. Where will we play? Among the pious of course. The saints will not come here. All day long they are busy with the secrets of the Torah and with Bonchuk Leviathan. 
In the evening, they are free to leave politics. <laughs> <laughs> what are they afraid of? A couple of murderers and rapers managed to escape from the hand. They prowl around at night. They have already killed several saints and have tried to ravish Surabastoyf. I hear this for the first time. Of course, as long as we don't have any magazines, no one is informed about anything. <laughs> the magazine will give us news and explain. Fantasies, fantasies called out a sinner who had been a politician on earth. Culture will not solve our problem and neither will the theater. What we really need is a, is a political party built on democratic principles. <laughs> we don't need to come out with impossible demands. Come with young We should be satisfied with a minimum. I have heard from a very reliable source that there is a liberal group among the angels who are asking for reforms in the hand. What kind of reforms? They want us to have a five-day Gehenna week. <laughs> Besides Saturdays and holidays, we should be given a week vacation in the world of illusions. Some of them would request that the nails of the beds of nails should be two millimeters shorter. We could do a lot, but we need money. <laughs> money, all the sinners called out with one voice, Yes, money. What do you know? And money answers all things, Ecclesiastes has said. If we had money, we could achieve everything without revolutions, without petitions, without culture. In the hand of everywhere else, everybody has his price. You are all a bunch of greenhorns. I know the hand from top to bottom and inside out. With money, we could even, the politician wanted to tell us listeners what else could be accomplished with money in Gehenna. But at that instant, the Sabbath ended. The fires leaped up again. The nails on the beds of nails began to glow with heat again. The punishing demons grabbed up their rods and a lashing and a whipping and a hanging and a wailing erupted once more. The politician who just spoke about money winked a knife toward one of the older demons, and both of them left. They are no one knew, most probably to play cards and to engage in conversation about some non kosher business. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.